Steve, what is it about the structure of reality which demands that in order for us to understand cosmology, the study of the universe, the origin and the ends of the everything that exists, we must understand subatomic particles and forces, which are the very smallest components of reality? Well, just as in everyday life, we, we want to know where we come from, what, what was at the beginning, or at least at some very early time. And uh, we know the universe is getting cooler. It's getting cooler because it's expanding. Mm -hmm. And just as the freon in the coils of a refrigerator cools when it expands, uh, that's what's happening to the whole universe. So it was once much hotter. Uh, how hot? Well, you name it. You go back that far, it was that Sorry. hot. Um, and when you go back to very early times, when the universe was a millionth of a millionth of a second old, the universe was so hot that particles banging into each other just from their heat uh, had enough energy to produce exotic particles that don't exist anywhere in the universe today except in elementary particle accelerators that we have to spend a lot of money to build. They're not available in ordinary life. And we can't understand what was going on at those very early times, say a millionth of a millionth of a second after the beginning, if there was a beginning, uh, without knowing more about these particles. We, one of the great roadblocks now in our understanding of the very early universe is our lack of understanding of matter, elementary particles uh, of exotic types that exist in our theories, but that we have not yet been able to create in the laboratory. And uh, our theories are tentative, uncertain. We need more information about them in order to be able to trace the universe back to its roots. So the common perception that you can use telescopes to look at galaxies and stars and learn everything we can is not sufficient. Certainly, uh, we learn a lot. And we can see galaxies back to a time when the universe was about a tenth as large as it is now. I, I don't mean that the whole universe uh, has any definite size. I mean that particles were that are now a certain distance apart then were a tenth as far apart. And when you go back earlier, there weren't any galaxies or stars. And what you had was just particles floating around. And uh, you go back a little bit further, they're just the ordinary particles we're familiar with in everyday life, uh, electrons and the particles that make up the atomic nucleus. But when you go back to a time when the universe was a very young, a millionth of a millionth of a second, say, there are exotic particles that we desperately need to know more about. So to understand fundamental physics, what are the areas that we must begin to understand? You know, space, time, energy, matter, forces. How, how do you characterize the general things we need to know? Well, we have a good working theory of space and time Einstein's general theory of relativity. We have a good framework for the understanding of elementary particles, atoms, nuclei. It's called quantum mechanics, which was developed in the 1920s. They don't work well together. When you apply quantum mechanics to space and time, including gravity, which is a, an aspect of space and time, uh, you get mathematical inconsistencies. I would say that's Big problem number one. We have to be able to understand space, time, and gravity in the language of quantum mechanics that we use to understand electrons and atomic nuclei. Tell me a little bit about quantum mechanics because that really underlies all theory of fundamental physics. Quantum mechanics is the language of fundamental physics. It's uh, what a graduate student in physics learns as becoming a physicist, I mean, it's, it's it's the um, it's the essential fr intellectual framework of physics. Uh, it is in in quantum mechanics. Uh, you don't describe nature in terms of just particles banging into each other the way I might refer to uh, just in passing, but uh, instead. The, the quantity which quantum mechanics focuses on is something called a wave function. 
uh, which describes not where particles are at any given instant, but what are the probabilities? Probabilities of what? Well, it depends what you ask. If you ask uh, what's the probability of finding a particle in a certain region of space and time, then doing certain mathematical operations on the wave function will tell you that. But if you ask what's the probability of a particle having a certain speed, then again, we know how to use the wave function and calculate that. The wave function evolves deterministically. That is, if you know what it is at one moment, you know what it is at any future moment, assuming you know what the system you're talking about is. And this confuses people because quantum mechanics sounds like it, it's all about probabilities. And it is if you insist on using the old language of particles moving around in space and time. Uh, if you say where a particle is at one instant, you can only make probabilistic statements about where it'll be at a future instant. But the wave function just evolves on like Old Man River, and uh, <laughs> if you, it keeps on going, <laughs> moving, and in a perfectly deterministic way. And it's only when human beings ask questions in the old-fashioned language of classical physics, like where is the electron? Like a billiard ball. Yeah, or what, where is the billiard ball? <laughs> or how fast is it moving, that then you have to, the, using the wave, the wave function, you only get information about probabilities. So it's an odd discipline in which you have a completely deterministic dynamical theory of how the wave function evolves and a probabilistic interpretation of that in terms of things that we're used to talking about, particle or billiard ball positions and speeds. But in order to understand the structure of everything, including the cosmology of the universe, we must deal with these wave functions and the, in a sense, a, 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 uh, a blurring of a duality between uh, a particle and a wave in this wave function. Yes and no. The, to understand the particles in, that make up the universe, we have to talk about quantum mechanics. When uh, we study what the universe was like when it was a millionth of a second old and we want to know uh, how the particles were distributed in speed and position, uh, we must use quantum mechanics to analyze that. The universe, on the other hand, is pretty big. And big things like tables mm -hmm. and chairs and the universe are very well approximately described in the old-fashioned language of classical mechanics. And the quantum mechanics has not yet been successfully applied to the whole universe. That's a big question. How do you describe the whole universe in the language? Is there such a thing because as a wave function of the universe, mm -hmm. not of a, a few particles? It, but is this because gravity is so important in defining the universe? Yes, it's, it's largely because we don't have a decent quantum mechanical theory of gravity. But also there are conceptual problems. Um, in quantum mechanics, we have a wave function which is evolving, and then we have an interpretive set of rules that tell us if you want to know things, what, what happens when you do an experiment, here are the rules for using the wave function to calculate the probabilities. Now, what do you mean when you do experiments on the whole universe? universe? Who's going to do those experiments? <laughs> uh, these are, are deep questions that haven't yet had a satisfactory answer. Uh, one of the most exciting things that have come out of recent theories of cosmology is that by applying quantum mechanics to the matter and fields that exist in the very early universe, uh, we're able to calculate how, what kind of inhomogeneities would have arisen, little burbles, little departures from perfect uniformity, which then evolved into what we see in the sky today as galaxies and clusters of galaxies and also a kind of mottling of the radio static that fills the universe. So if everything were smooth at the beginning... It would be smooth be... now and we wouldn't right. be here, right. right. Uh, and the departure from smoothness is something that we use quantum mechanics to calculate and it works. So those incredibly small fluctuations from smoothness in the early universe yeah. that would be extraordinarily microscopic have actually are actually the seeds if you will 
of current macro structures. Right. And like because galaxies. the universe expands, they've become much larger. And um, the, the wonderful thing is, and this is a matter just of the past decade or so, this is, this is new and makes cosmology now, I think, one of the most exciting uh, areas of, of physical science, or perhaps of all science, is that um, by applying quantum mechanics to the matter in the very early universe, long at a, at a time much, much earlier than anything we can see directly with telescopes or uh, radio receivers or anything like that, uh, we can calculate the pattern of inhomogeneities, uh, the departures from smoothness, and a actually compare it with what we observe in the universe today, mm. and it works. And it's it, remarkable. <laughs> the, some of the um, some of the observations are truly heroic. For example, there's a satellite called WMAP for Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, which is sent out a million miles from Earth. Uh, it circles the moon in order to pick up speed from the moon's motion and goes much further, four times further than the moon, out to a spot in the solar system where it can rest, spot called L2, where things at L2 just stay there. Because of gravity. Yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a stable position in the solar system. And it, it revolves around the sun with the, with the earth always between it and the sun. It's very cold and quiet there. It's unmanned. <laughs> this is an unmanned satellite. Sure. You'd be glad to hear. <laughs> and, um, yes, you know, wouldn't, you want to want, wouldn't want to live there. And, um, this, uh, satellite has just been sitting there for three years, collecting radio signals from all directions in the sky and, uh, not listening for distant, civilizations or anything, listening for tiny little uh, fluctuations, little departures from uniformity as they look in different directions. And that pattern is then compared with theory. And the theory is the theory of the quantum mechanical fluctuations in the very early universe. And by God, it works. The theory matches the experiments, but it only matches the experiments when you choose certain numerical quantities to have certain values. For instance, by matching the theory and the observation, this tells you what the age of the universe is. We now know that the universe, at least in the present Big Bang, is 13.7 plus or minus <laughs> 0.2 billion years old. Can you imagine that kind of precision? That's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, the, the, the observers who do this, I think, are... are <laughs> Great heroes, even if they don't, they don't go out a million miles from Earth. 